pirmasis pranešimas introduction to open shift as powerful as possible, tu esi žinosim, kaip to possible yra, tai Egor Golubkov yra IBM techninis specialistas, jo specializacija yra labai plati nuo power serverių, dominų saugyklų, kontinizacijos sprendimų, jis prisijungė prie IBM komandos, atėjo iš tokių turintis didelį inžinierinio darbo patirtį Siemens, Deutsche Bahn, Volkswagen, tai žmogus tikrai matės ir iš biznių ir iš IT pusės. Va, tai jau dabar persijungiu visą į anglų kalbą. Egor, the floor is yours with your presentation about OpenShift. Thank you, Aldas. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. And today, my goal is to present you some basic concepts of OpenShift. And the ultimate goal is to make it as clear as possible for you. So if you have any questions, I would appreciate to answer them. Uh, during the presentation or after uh, as you want. So now I will share my presentation. Okay, now it should be seen like the first slide. Uh, Aldas, let me know if, uh, if it is seen, if everything works correctly. Yes, it is. Perfect. All right, so uh, today's topic is uh, introduction to OpenShift uh, as powerful as possible. Uh, and uh, we will start with uh, with the agenda. So the three main uh, fields that I would like to cover today. Uh, the first one is uh, I will show you the IT trends uh, on the market. So uh, we're going to talk about why uh, the market is moving towards uh, hybrid cloud. Then uh, in the second part, we will talk about uh, Red Hat OpenShift. Uh, what is it? How is it working? And uh, why is it important uh, for the hybrid cloud infrastructure? And uh, in the last point, we'll talk about the IBM Power Servers uh, as a fundament for hybrid cloud. So we're going to talk about um, our advantages uh, comparing to the uh, to, uh, to other uh, servers, and uh, this is why uh, the uh, the topic of of today's uh, presentation is like an introduction to OpenShift as powerful as possible. So it is somehow connected with uh, with the power servers. So. Um, the, the first uh, the first slide I would like you to show is um, that I found some uh, some uh, research uh, about uh, to 2023 uh, about the cloud market dynamics and there are three interesting numbers uh, I would like to tell you about so the first one is that uh, 90 percent companies uh, will use multi-cloud environment in 2023 so basically in, in all already in two years uh, multi-cloud environment means that um, a company can use services from more than two cloud providers. So let's say we can use um, IBM Cloud, let's say for uh, our our business applications. We can use Google Cloud for our internal data analysis, and let's say uh, Azure or uh, AWS, AWS for um, other uh, applications. So this is what we call multi-cloud when when we use multiple uh, cloud providers and multiple uh, cloud services in our company. Then uh, the second interesting number is that 70% uh, companies will use virtual machines and containers. So today uh, we're going to talk more about uh, containerization, but uh, Maria uh, in the next presentation will uh, tell you something more about the difference between virtual machines and containers. Uh, but uh, it's also an interesting number. And the last one is that 50% um, processes uh, will be run in hybrid multi-cloud. And um, for me, it's also interesting because uh, uh, there are different definitions of hybrid cloud. Uh, sometimes it is seen as the connection of uh, some multi-cloud, some public cloud and private cloud. And um, sometimes this um, this definition may be confusing. This is why on the next slide, I will show you what means hybrid cloud for me. And I think that uh, that may clarify uh, the uh, total, the, the, the ultimate definition of uh, hybrid cloud. But these numbers uh, at the end show that uh, the future uh, of the IT mic, mic, uh, of the IT mic market is hybrid. So this is why today uh, we're going to talk about hybrid cloud a lot. So at the end, uh, the, the simplest definition, and I think the most uh, effective one, is that uh, hybrid cloud is the connection of um, advantages from two sides. On one side, we have uh, public cloud with uh, strong sides as scalability and elasticity if we are talking about costs and uh, performance. 
but of course uh, in cloud we are not the owner of of uh, our data so there is some cloud provider that um, stores the data this is why um, this is like the disadvantage disadvantage of, of cloud and on the other side we have the on-premises uh, architecture so we have physical machines like servers like uh, storage devices and um, with uh, with this uh, architecture we have more security and more control and hybrid cloud uh, what does hybrid cloud do is that it connects the uh, strongest sites from cloud and from on-premise and it is somehow in the middle so today uh, if we are talking about uh, OpenShift then uh, we should say that uh, today there is no such approach as one cloud fits all. It means that uh, today companies have a lot of uh, requirements uh, towards business, towards scalability, towards uh, power performance, and there is no one cloud provider that will uh, fulfill all the requirements. This is why companies uh, are looking uh, towards multi-cloud environment. This is what I was talking in the beginning. So uh, we are using multiple services from multiple cloud providers to um, to fulfill our needs. IBM and uh, Red Hat, uh, they've noticed this uh, trend on the market and this is why they have uh, created together some hybrid multi-cloud strategy. And uh, this strategy is based on the Red Hat OpenShift container platform. So this is the technology we're going to talk about today. And um, if you install this uh, OpenShift uh, technology on uh, IBM power servers and on storage machines, then uh, you get the optimal performance, the optimal pricing and reliability. So today, uh, all the three uh, presentations of mine from Maria and from Bartek, we all cover um, the advantages of uh, our machines. So uh, the hybrid, uh, the journey to hybrid cloud uh, begins with, first of all, of course, we have to install uh, the OpenShift technology and uh, it's also called like somehow open hybrid cloud platform this is um this is an open source it's openshift is based on open source this is why it can be installed on uh, basically every architecture so we can uh, install it on power servers on x86 servers on mindframes and uh, also on public clouds and uh, when you have installed this uh, OpenShift, then you can build and run uh, scalable applications which are based on containers. So this is what uh, we're going to talk about also today. At the end, uh, if, we have, um, if we have OpenShift, then uh, we see that from one side we have this public clouds with all the um, strong sides like uh, scalability in terms of costing, but of course we have less system control. And on the right side we have the on-premise infrastructure with power and with storage. Uh, we have more uh, control, more security, but of course uh, higher higher um, investment in the beginning. And the uh, hybrid cloud is somewhere in the middle connecting uh, both sides and uh, it gives us the open hybrid cloud platform to uh, to connect the both sides and get the best out of it so um, this is uh, where we could place red hat openshift and uh, going more into the detail uh, of course uh, first of all i would like to say uh, something more about the container so uh, as i said in the beginning uh, today we're doing like the, the introduction to the topic and uh, for me it is important that you understand uh, the basic concepts of it so the container basically uh, is a software package that contains everything the software needs to run so this includes the executable program as well as uh, system tools libraries and settings so containers are not installed like traditional software programs which uh, allow them to be isolated from other software and the operating system uh, itself uh, then this is like the, the isolated uh, nature of containers provides several benefits so uh, first the software uh, in a container uh, will run the same in different environments so for example a, a container that includes a mysql database can run identically on both a linux computer and on a windows machine and the second uh, containers provide added security since the software will not affect the host operating system so while an installed application may um, uh, may affect the system uh, and modify resources uh, while container can only modify settings within the container. So as I said, it's a small package and uh, it can be changed only inside. So it does not affect our operating system. So uh, we have greater flexibility and greater uh, security. So um, 
This makes containers uh, ideal for software testing and uh, development. Then uh, the third point uh, to remember from, from this presentation is that uh, containers are lightweight uh, comparing to, to virtual machine. So there may be a small, um, a small um, comparison so containers are basically similar uh, to virtual machines uh, since they include everything need to run in a single package but uh, unlike virtual machines uh, containers do not include a guest operating system and instead containers are on top of a container platform like docker uh, which we're going to talk about later which is installed on an operating system so we have as you can see uh, on this um, on this picture we have host operating system of our machine then we have the docker engine and uh, every container uses the um, resources from from the docker engine so uh, containers are lightweight meaning that uh, they require far less disk space uh, than virtual machines and additionally multiple containers can run uh, side by side on the same uh, container platform so uh, the three points uh, to remember about the container that it's a software package uh, that has everything needed for the application to run the second point is that uh, it has an isolated nature which gives it flexibility so we can install it on every machine and uh, it has the security so it does not it cannot attack uh, our uh, our operating system and of course it's lightweight so we can move it between uh, one architecture and another and we can also move it to the cloud so uh, it's completely completely lightweight and flexible so this is about the the containers and then moving uh, towards uh, the application so as i said in the beginning um, the journey to hybrid cloud the journey with openshift begins with uh, building and installing applications uh, based on containers and these applications are uh, they named they're named uh, cloud native apps so at the beginning uh, we had uh, the monolithic applications and a monolithic application describes a single tiered application in which uh, the user interface and data access are combined into a single program from a single platform so monolithic also describes a software application that is designed without modularity so modularity is needed to uh, reuse parts of the application and to enable maintenance uh, for example to, to replace some parts uh, without stopping the whole application so with uh, monolith we do not have this modularity and uh, this is why we have on the other side we have this microservices so uh, microservices are um, smaller uh, services like the lego blocks uh, within a larger architecture so in the case of having a shopping cart uh, you might have a cart service a shipping service and a payment service so for example um, let's say we have an uh, application uh, to for the for the online shopping and for example one small microservice can be um, uh, can be responsible for the uh, product catalog so you can see you can uh, swipe down uh, the, the catalog of products you want to buy so this is the one microservice the other microservice would be the cart service so you see which products you have added to your cart and the third microservice is for example the online payment and for example if you have the um, higher uh, higher let's say um, you have the higher count of customers that want to buy uh, products at the same time let's say during the um, <clears throat> uh, during christmas time that is coming right now then uh, then of course it is uh, it is very important to have this uh, service um, let's say upgraded and have some more uh, sh uh, some more um, online payment services so that every customer gets uh, the highest performance and doesn't have to wait uh, until the uh, application responses. So this is not possible with monolith applications since uh, we cannot upgrade uh, some parts of it, but with microservices, we upgrade only these, uh, these small blocks that are needed for us. And of course, with uh, every microservice uh, can be developed by another development team. So uh, this is what enables uh, the the benefits for the uh, microservices architecture at the end uh, what is uh, what needed to be said that the cloud native app the the, the new uh, way of um, cloud native apps is that uh, applications are container packaged uh, running the application and processes as isolated units 
So this is the first point. The second, that they are dynamically managed by a central orchestrating process, for example, such as Kubernetes. We're going to talk about Kubernetes a bit later. And uh, the third point to remember is that they are microservices oriented, having small focused applications uh, that are designed to be composable via services endpoints, for example, like uh, the APIs. So uh, at the end, this approach allows enterprises to ship faster, uh, reduce risk, and increase efficiency by building smaller autonomous services that can be started and stopped on demand with uh, little consequence uh, for our architecture. So this is the main difference to remember between the monolith and the cloud native uh, application. So this is it. And um, maybe uh, to show it once again, uh, I want to, uh, to illustrate service scaling for both a monolithic and a microservices based architecture just to uh, have like the concept, uh, the, the basic understanding of what does it mean. For example, in uh, monolith applications, uh, we have some services and let's say we want to uh, to have one services upgraded. Let's say we, uh, it's going to be this uh, this circle. Uh, from the other side, we have this microservices architecture where every uh, service is packaged into the uh, into the service block. So let's say the container, and uh, if the degraded service, so the uh, the circle one, uh, is a part of a microservices architecture, then the affected service is scaled independent of the other uh, application services. So as you can see here, uh, we are adding uh, we are adding only components with the uh, circles and uh, we optimize the usage of um, let's say our hard hardware infrastructure so we do not uh, use everything uh, the whole power that comes with service but only the smaller parts for uh, only for this circle service and uh, when a particular service in a monolith application degrades then scaling the service uh, to improve performance implies scaling all of the other uh, application services and of course this comes with um, some performance issues so we have to wait until the uh, all the uh, additional blocks will be upgraded so this is why uh, scaling the microservices application is much more faster easier and also effective uh, in terms of cost so this is uh, what comes with uh, with the containers with applications and then uh, when the company uh, is growing it has more and more containers then we need some software uh, that will be managing uh, all these containers and this is where uh, the kubernetes comes from so kubernetes uh, to remember uh, from greek uh, it's a greek word uh, it means the pilot or uh, helmsman so um, this is like that's a person that helps you navigate uh, in the water so uh, let's imagine a ship uh, shipping the uh, containers and someone we have this kubernetes that is orchestrating that is managing uh, the whole situation so this is why uh, it is uh, easy to remember what this kubernetes is about so it's just a, a pilot for containers so uh, kubernetes was built to radically uh, change the way that the applications are built and deployed in the cloud so fundamentally it was designed to give developers more velocity efficiency and agility so to remember is that platform uh, that kubernetes is a platform for uh, container orchestration so the container management and uh, we have some um, some options which are not available only with uh, containers so the, the kubernetes is putting some uh, some additional features that help uh, developers uh, manage manage the whole uh, infrastructure so for example we have the service discovery and load balancing which means that kubernetes can expose a container using the dns name or using their own uh, ip address so for example it tra if uh, traffic to a container is high then uh, kubernetes is able to load balance and distribute the network traffic so that the deployment is stable then uh, we have this um, <coughs> Uh, storage orchestration, so which means that Kubernetes allows you to automatically mount a storage system of your choice, uh, such as uh, local storages, public cloud providers, and more. Then, of course, it's an online self-healing system, which means that uh, it receives a desired state configuration, so it doesn't simply take actions to make the current state match the desired state in a single time, but it continuously take uh, action to ensure that the current state matches the desired state so this is like the online self-healing system so that means that uh, not only kubernetes will initialize your system but it will guard it against any failures and uh, problems that might destabilize your system and affect reliability so for example if we define that we need uh, three services 
or uh, three uh, replicas or, uh, to Kubernetes, then it doesn't just create three replicas. It continuously ensures that there are exactly three replicas available. So for example, if we manually uh, create a fourth replica, so the next one, Kubernetes will destroy it because uh, in the desired state, we have three uh, number three defined and it will keep it. And uh, if, we, if we manually destroyed one replica, then the Kubernetes will create one to gain return you to the desired state of three replicas. So this is, <clears throat> it comes with the automation. Then uh, Kubernetes um, is also the open source platform. Uh, that means that it has more than um, <clears throat> Uh, 10,000 uh, developers and uh, this is uh, one of the most uh, one of the fastest growing open source uh, projects ever and it's getting more and more popular because uh, at least 50 percent of uh, fortune 100 list companies are using kubernetes so as you can see it is getting more and more popular and it automates the the, the management of the hybrid cloud architecture in your company then um what is what is a pod? So uh, pods are the the smallest, most basic deployable objects in Kubernetes. So a pod represents a single instance of a running process in your cluster. So pods contain one or more containers, and uh, when a pod runs multiple containers, the containers are managed in a single entity and share the pod's uh, resources. Also, uh, it is. Um, it is easier to remember because pod from English means like the, the family of um, of whales. And uh, as you can remember, uh, the Docker, uh, which represents the container, has uh, this logo of a whale. So a pod uh, is, it, it's an environment where uh, the containers are managed uh, in the Kubernetes. And uh, a pod is also a family of whales. So you can, uh, you can imagine it as pod uh, is somewhere is it like environment where uh, a lot of containers are managed together such as like same as uh, the family of whales traveling through the ocean so this is somehow uh, makes it I, I think it makes it easier to to remember what is actually a pod and then uh, moving forward um, we have uh, this open shift uh, that uh, we were talking about at the beginning and uh, Red Hat OpenShift is basically uh, a Kubernetes, but uh, for the enterprises. That means that uh, it gives some more um, some more features upon Kubernetes, uh, which I'm going to talk about later. And uh, it's also, uh, let's say, uh, a very OpenShift. You can imagine OpenShift as a very very strong uh, Kubernetes. So. Uh, at the end, it's an open source platform for containerized uh, applications. It is based on Docker and on Kubernetes. And then what gives additionally is, for example, this lifecycle management. So uh, we have this um, uh, possibility to build the image, to implement it, to maintain it uh, inside the OpenShift cluster. Then <clears throat> we have this infrastructure. So uh, we have here a variety of environments and tools for building, deploying. So we have this CI CD, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment, monitoring and aggregations uh, for containerized application. And um, in addition, it is a multi tenant solution, so which provides a logical separation of, indiv of individual users. Uh, from the infrastructure layer to the access permissions uh, of the application. Then uh, there is a security, so uh, OpenShift adds additional um, <coughs> uh, authentication and authorization mechanisms and provides uh, like seamless collaboration uh, with uh, Active Directory and also other third-party uh, applications to ensure uh, the highest advanced protection policy for your environment. Then there is also this uh, RBAC, so role-based access control, so you can define which users get the access to which uh, data uh, in your company. And then uh, on the right side, uh, there is a uh, citation, a quotation uh, of one of the customers of OpenShift, which said that they, they have decided uh, for OpenShift because they didn't want to be tied to any single cloud provider. So this is what uh, OpenShift gives you, is that uh, this flexibility of what you can, uh, of which services you want to use, and you can all, uh, all of them can be installed on OpenShift independently of uh, one cloud provider. So uh, OpenShift gives you flexibility and uh, to remember it's also based on the open, uh, open source technology. This is why 
uh, it gives you a lot of choices. At the end, uh, the value of OpenShift, uh, at, uh, like um, on the bottom, you have Red Hat Enterprise Linux and the core OS. Uh, so it's an embedded container host that brings a new operation paradigm where the host and infrastructure are fully managed uh, by the cluster. And uh, upon of that, uh, you have this Kubernetes cluster that provides the management and orchestrates containers on multiple nodes in, in, in the OpenShift cluster. But then um, we have this uh, more options. For example, we have uh, the ETCD, uh, which is like the, the key component of Kubernetes because um, uh, it has the state, the desired state of the cluster. And uh, Kubernetes is checking what is inside this ETCD configuration to uh, to maintain the desired state. Then we have all the containerized services uh, with infrastructure functions such as networking components and uh, authorizations. Then we have uh, runtimes uh, that are ready to use uh, by developers. And uh, each of the runtime is pre-configured with a particular runtime language or a database, and they can be used um, like to to extend the frameworks by the developers to extend the libraries and even the the other middleware uh, products uh, so we have a lot of a lot of tools to choose and then of course openshift provides a web user interface or the command line interface so regarding of um, of uh, the skills of for example of the administrator you can use uh, either the um, graphical user interface or the uh, command line interface and um, choose the best option for him then uh, the basic uh, components of openshift uh, there are three of them so the bootstrap node is the first one the second is the control node and the third one is the compute node so these are the three elements to remember uh, because each machine in the cluster requires information about the cluster uh, when it's provisioned then openshift uses a temporary bootstrap machine uh, during initial configuration to provide the, the the quiet information to the permanent control plane uh, it boots by using an ignition config file that describes how to create the cluster so basically bootstrap gives you the basic information how the cluster should be created then uh, the bootstrap machine creates the control plane machine and then the control plane machine creates uh, the uh, compute node and um, uh, the compute nodes are also known as worker machines so this is where you put your application and uh, the application and the running by the by the compute nodes or by the worker machines um, and after the cluster machine uh, initialize then the bootstrap machine is destroyed because uh, it only contains the basic information so uh, we do not need this component anymore when the whole cluster uh, is running so it also it is only needed um, at the beginning then um, these are like the, the three components and now um, we are moving to the uh, hardware uh, part of the uh, presentation uh, where I will show you why um, hardware uh, in terms of OpenShift is uh, crucial, basically. So now uh, we'll talk more about, um, more about uh, um, financial aspects of this uh, technology. First uh, to, to remember is that uh, like the, the, the main difference between the x86 servers and the power servers, so the, the infrastructure where you can install OpenShift, is that uh, x86 servers uh, can use uh, only two threads per core. Uh, threads means that um, there are uh, simultaneous um, simultaneous computing power, uh, which can uh, analyze th two threads uh, at the same time. Then uh, power servers have uh, more options. So we can have this uh, simultaneous multi-threading uh, with one thread in each core, or we can also have this eight threads at the same time. So this means that the same core analyzes eight instructions at the same time, which means that it has more uh, performance uh, and more power. Why is it important? Because uh, if we move to the, um, to the um, minimum uh, requirements to run the uh, OpenShift container platform, then uh, we need three uh, three components. So at the same time, uh, as I said, first the component is the temporary bootstrap machine. Then we have the control plane machines and this uh, compute nodes. So there are three elements uh, which need to be installed uh, for the minimum configuration of the Red Hat OpenShift. Then uh, operating system, of course, is like the, the core OS I've been talking about earlier. And then uh, this here, this column is important because 
it shows uh, how many threads, uh, so how many uh, computing power each uh, element consumes. And uh, the important is that, for example, if we have uh, the um, SMT mode eight uh, for our course, that means that uh, one thread, so one uh, one uh, virtual CPU consumes only one eighth uh, of our core. If we um, if we let's say define our core to run uh, two threads at the same time, then one uh, one thread consumes uh, the half of power of the available power in our core. The important thing to remember is that uh, subscription, so the costs are needed only for compute node. So uh, the more applications we run, uh, the more uh, power performance we need, then uh, we need to uh, buy subscriptions only for the compute node. And uh, now it's important uh, to see that the compute node consumes, every compute node consumes uh, two threads at the same time. Uh, this means that if we need uh, at least two compute nodes uh, to run the minimum uh, OpenShift cluster, then uh, here we have four threads to be uh, consumed. So we need uh, the sus subscription for four threads. And now in x86 servers, you can have one or two threads at the same time, which means that uh, if we need four threads for our compute node, then you need two cores at least. With power servers, uh, you can choose your uh, core SMT4 or SMT8. So uh, it's enough for you to have one core uh, to run the co two compute nodes. So one core for power servers and two cores for x86 servers. This means that uh, with uh, the more cores you have, for your open shift, the more licenses you need. And uh, this is where uh, the advantage of power servers comes in. As you need less computing power, you need less cores in your server to run the same environment. So it's not only uh, more power uh, performance, but it, al it also uh, lets you save the license cost, save the electricity costs, because you have smaller machines, but these power servers are uh, high more, um, much more reliable and much more um, stronger if we're talking about the core performance. So this is why it's important to remember from these slides that uh, the threads, the, the, the threads that are consumed by the machines are important uh, regarding the uh, subscription, so regarding the licenses. And uh, with power servers, you need uh, fewer licenses to run the same um, environment. This is why it is more important to to understand like this uh, this power performance uh, differences talking about the the servers uh, basically this s922 server is our star let's say um, at least on the on the polish market uh, because it has a place for two uh, cpus so for two processors that bring uh, the power performance and in each processor you can have uh, 4 8 10 or 11 cores uh, let's say in one processor Max uh, RAM memory is four terabytes, so uh, a lot of uh, a lot of computing power uh, available. And uh, of course, each uh, container, the more containers you have, the more uh, RAM memory you need, and the more uh, cores performance uh, is required. Then uh, the disk space, uh, there are internal disks, so we can uh, install eight disks uh, in the server. But um, our um, our suggestion is that to combine the power servers with the storage machines, as storage machines have um, very high reliability, they have this uh, right controls and uh, much more space coming uh, also with the security. So uh, normally our customers are combining power servers with storage machines and then there is a complete uh, solution um, to store the data and also to analyze the data uh, on the CPUs. Then uh, the operational system that can be installed, of course, it's Linux with CoreOS available. Then there is uh, our uh, internal uh, IBM operating systems like IX and IBM I. Uh, so it's also available to be installed and our virtualizer is PowerVM. Then on the other side, there is a bigger server. So uh, this height is like twice as much as the S922. So it is a little bit more, uh, it has a little higher performance. So we have uh, two cores per CPU and uh, we have uh, 18 disks available to be installed inside. But as I said um, earlier, it is much more uh, 
um, much more reliable to connect power servers with storage machines. Then uh, we've done our internal tests to compare the power servers and the x86 servers. And uh, the tests um, were made uh, in this way that uh, on every machine on uh, IBM Power and on Intel, uh, we have installed two virtual machines. Uh, and um, on each virtual machine, we wanted to install as many um, as many containers as possible. And these containers have to uh, communicate with the MongoDB database. And the uh, reply from this MongoDB couldn't uh, extend, couldn't extend one second, couldn't exceed one second. So um, the test was to install uh, the containers and to make them communicate with the database and to wait uh, how fast are they uh, getting the, the answer from the MongoDB database. And um, we could install 174 containers on uh, IBM Power Machine, on IBM Power Server. And at the same time, uh, we have installed only 98 containers uh, on the x86 machine. And then uh, with every next container we installed, then the, the reply time from the MongoDB has exceeded one second. So this is this, this was the point where we stopped our tests and said that uh, 174 containers can communicate with the MongoDB database in less than one second. And on the same server, only 98 containers could communicate with MongoDB uh, in less than one second. As you can see here, uh, the, the um, configuration has that uh, IBM Power Server had uh, 20 cores inside and Intel has uh, had uh, 36 cores, the same memory. So um, we have recalculated the number of containers and uh, the number of cores. And it turned out that the IBM power servers uh, have um, uh, greater, uh, greater performance, greater power per uh, one core. And of course uh, it comes with the uh, reliability, with performance and with uh, the costs of uh, licenses. Then uh, we, this is uh, what was about uh, the uh, Power 9th um, generation. And now uh, we are having the Power 10, the newest servers, uh, which are even more stronger than the 9s. And um, here is the roadmap for you to, uh, to, to remember. So uh, now currently we are having this uh, enterprise machines available on the market. Uh, th these are our biggest machines. And the scale-out servers, so uh, the machines that are uh, relevant, let's say, that are the same uh, to the S922 servers, so the, these two machines that I've shown you previously, they are coming um, in the first half of the next year. And then this is where we're expecting uh, that uh, these servers will be also, uh, let's say, dedicated for hybrid cloud, dedicated for um, cloud-native applications, so that the containers will run even more effectively than before. And as you can see, even before with the older generation of Power9, uh, they are running much more faster uh, than the available x86 servers. At the end, um, we have this uh, highest uh, reliability on the market. That was the ITIC uh, study. And uh, with the 12 year um, already, uh, 12 year like in common so uh, uh, starting from uh, 2009 uh, we have the highest reliability on the market and you can see here uh, these are the numbers uh, given in hours per year where we had um, unplanned downtime so let's say a small um, small maintenance uh, was needed to make the servers run again and as you can see here are all the um, all the providers of service so we have IBM we have Lenovo Huawei HP Cisco and uh, you see that uh, the power servers had the smallest, uh, the shortest uh, unplanned downtime during the year. And uh, of course, here it's important to remember that uh, every minute uh, costs uh, costs money. And uh, the thing at the end is that uh, every customer has to know what uh, costs, what is the cost of one minute of unplanned downtime for his business. So for example, if somebody has the production uh, production company and uh, the whole production is stopped for one hour, then the cost will be even higher. And uh, I think that this graph shows uh, the reliability, which is also important. And of course, together with uh, reliability comes uh, the highest performance uh, compared to the x86 server. So I think uh, that this uh, this slide is 
as uh, well to uh, to remember and at the end uh, i would like to to summarize uh, my presentation so at the beginning we said about the it trends that uh, the market is moving uh, towards hybrid cloud so the the native uh, the cloud native application will be more and more popular the containeriz the containerization is also uh, getting more uh, attention. Then we've talked about the Red Hat OpenShift. So uh, it is based on Docker, it is based on Kubernetes. So it's like the open hybrid cloud platform. Then uh, we've been talking about uh, IBM Power Servers, which are uh, dedicated for hybrid cloud. They are optimized for OpenShift because IBM develops OpenShift with uh, Red Hat. Uh, we said that uh, Power Servers have higher performance and then a higher performance means also lower license cost in terms of um, applications such as uh, OpenShift or let's say Oracle databases. It's also uh, the use case for uh, our servers. And uh, we have this highest reliability on the market, which means that um, it is uh, it is always uh, reliable. And uh, even we've been talking with, uh, with one of our customers and he said that uh, the last server he bought from us was in uh, 2014. And until now, the server is like, I think it was like power six generation. So uh, the, an older one. And this customer said that the server is still reliable, is still running. So I don't need the new one because uh, why should I buy the new one when, when the older one is still working correctly? So this is this what comes with, uh, with this reliability uh, of power servers. And of course, um, it is also possible to loan uh, the servers. Uh, so the, the first one which is available is the S92 and the second is the S, uh, AC92, which is dedicated for, um, for uh, artificial intelligence. So if you would like to test the performance, uh, it, there are two options to loan the server. The first one is uh, to get this server physically to your, uh, to your uh, company and let's say to have it for, uh, for one month. Or if you want, uh, we can also give you the VPN access to our environment and you can test it, um, you can test it uh, via the, the VPN. So you do not have to, uh, to maintain the server like for, let's say for one month, but you just can access it um, from your computer locally and of course uh, we uh, support uh, we support our customers uh, with our lab services um, uh, department so uh, if if there is some uh, some use case with the hybrid cloud implementation or any other technical uh, IT um, aspect then uh, we support our customers with uh, with uh, with our technology skills so uh, I, if you if you have any any questions or uh, you would like to contact me, then uh, you have my uh, contact data, and uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Igor. Uh, as I can see, uh, only only praise for you, Igor. That's very clear. Thanks, Igor. So, but uh, sure. Uh, maybe maybe there will be uh, some additional questions. We have a, a question and answer session. Sure, after. I will be here the whole time. So yeah, yeah. if you have any question, yeah. uh, I will answer them. Okay, uh, but we will have that session after all three presentations. Uh, but still, still we have uh, some some time left. Uh, can, can, I, I have one <laughs> sort of personal question, not personal, but the question uh, which which we discussed a bit. Um, and I think that that your answer is is quite uh, useful. Uh, when considering, you, you've said that a hybrid uh, hybrid cloud is the future. And yes. one would think, uh, why should I have anything on premise? Uh, I should move to the to, to, to cloud uh, and 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 worry about anything. Uh, what what are uh, what are the conditions or what what are obviously aspects that would uh, would force uh, a company? To, to still have a hybrid uh, maybe that's that's on premise on the system which is uh, uh, which works only on premises and it cannot be easily migrated to cloud what 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 are your your thoughts on uh, sure Mm -hmm. Sure. So at the end, uh, it all comes down to costs and uh, hybrid cloud enables you to optimize uh, the cost because uh, one part of your architecture is on premises and one part is um, in the cloud. And the thing is to to ask the, the thing to ask a company is um, what data should be stored locally and what data can be moved to the cloud. So normally the data which is stored locally uh, 
is more expensive because you have to maintain it, uh, but at the end, you have more control over it. So if you have some sensitive data of your customers and you do not want to give it to the third cloud provider, so the third party, uh, then of course, uh, you have to keep it locally. But at the, sen at the same time, we have more and more uh, interesting uh, cloud services like uh, let's say you have the chatbots you have the artificial intelligence uh, engines uh, the deep learning machines and uh, they are uh, available in the cloud and sometimes uh, cloud comes uh, with this option pay as you go so uh, this is why uh, if for example if you need the newer uh, the newer cloud service, like the let's say the chatbot or something from the artificial intelligence, then uh, you can use use the services in the cloud, but still you can keep your sensitive data locally. Uh, but of course, uh, this the, it comes at the end. It comes down to uh, how sensitive is your data and uh, how much control you want to have over it. Okay, and uh, is is there such a consideration that that for example you have mentioned Christmas uh, Christmas period? Yeah. Uh, and an increase perhaps in e-commerce and and maybe other commerce also or, or even even uh, production etc. So uh, is is that a good rationale? I think that some basic load uh, of of my my applications could be served on premises, but I have a possibility to to have uh, additional uh, computing power uh, on on uh, on the cloud. And yes. maybe maybe uh, Red Hat uh, uh, and uh, and OpenShift and, and containers are the answer the, that that can uh, easily uh, make that that elasticity. Of, exactly. Of yeah. So uh, what gives you Red Hat OpenShift is uh, this scalability. So you can scale scale your application. Uh, accordingly to the load, as you said. So if you have like the basic load during the year, then uh, there are some, some months or maybe some weeks or some days in the week where this where we have this peak load. And uh, this is exactly the moment where um, the containers can help us because we just um, scale them. Uh, we scale the services, uh, let's say the, this uh, service uh, responsible for the online shopping. We can scale it uh, accordingly to the um, to the load. And then we pay, of course, for this uh, increased load, but only like for the only for this time where we have this peak load and then we come back to our normal pricing. So this is where the scalability from OpenShift uh, helps us to optimize the costs. OK, uh, we have two questions. I think we, we, we can uh, use a few minutes of, of, of uh, previewed uh, break, for which, which will be in a few minutes. One of them is from Oleg uh, Suchodolsky. How yeah. open power service compares to uh, ARM under service? Yeah. Sure. So uh, currently we are using this. Um, uh, we have our internal tests, uh, which compare uh, Firstly, mainly, so mainly we, we compare the power service with uh, x86 servers. Uh, and uh, currently we do not have this uh, comparison between the power service and the IRM Ampere uh, architecture, but uh, with Power10, uh, we will have this comparison. So I think uh, in March, in April, uh, we're gonna have these numbers to compare uh, the performance. Yeah, because currently currently we've been only working with the um, uh, with this comparison between us and the x86 servers. Okay, and, and maybe you can see also, uh, there's another question from Vitalius Prishapanok. Uh, why Oracle yep. didn't use IBM service and uses their Exadata with Solaris? And, and a smile, yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> sure. So uh, I think that uh, Exadata with Solaris is somehow, uh, is like strongly connected uh, with Oracle, but um, at the end, um, we have from like for one side we have this uh, performance uh, performance uh, aspects which comes with hardware and uh, on the other side we have this licenses cost and of course uh, oracle database uh, can be um, uh, is like more optimized uh, costly to run um, primarily on on exadata and on solaris but um, if we have a customer and we have a lot of customers that uh, they do not only look at the um, costs of the databases but they also look at the performance for other applications and this is where power comes into play so uh, the servers are uh, so powerful that on part of the uh, let's say we have 10 cores and uh, we can run oracle on eight cores and then we still have some more power to run other applications so, so this is why 
power comes into play uh, with Oracle and uh, why Oracle didn't use our servers. I think uh, it's about these uh, external politics. So uh, it's all about the product and uh, about the competition. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you. we have time now for sort of technical break. Uh, we we may, may may leave this this conference or postpone it for for a, a mere three four minutes, and I think uh, we will get back at thirteen fifty five uh, with presentation from Maria, and I, I will introduce that after four minutes. Okay, thank you. So we we'll start thirteen fifty five. So I'll be here in the chat. So if uh, if uh, anyone has answers, then uh, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. So, sveiki visi sugrįžę, kas, kas spėjot, kas negrįžo, tai, 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 tai sveiki, kai sugrįžit. Uh, tai perinam prie, prie antrojo pranešimo, uh, aš trumpai pristatysiu uh, pranešėje. Marija Šulach uh, iš IBM uh, Polską, iš, iš, iš Lenkijos, uh, jinai uh, papasakos apie IBM Storage Made Flexible for Containers ir Ten bus visokių įdomių dalykų kaip container ready, container native, papaskos, kuo tie dalykai skiriasi. Jei dar nežinojo, tai žinojo, tai, tai galėsim pasigilinti tos klausimus giliau. Marija užsiema tiek, tiek, tiek pardavimų 
klausimais tiek tiek aparatinės, tiek techninės įrango žodžiu irgi yra plataus, plataus profilio specialistai ir tikrai manau tai, ko jie nepapasakos, mes tikrai galėsim imti ir jos, jos paklausti. Tai ir daugiausia Marija dirba su, su įranga, kurio jie skirta duomenų, duomenų centrams. Įranga sprendimas, kurie skirti duomenų centrams. Tai, uh, Maria, I, I shortly introduced you in Lithuanian, as, as I understand you understood everything about that. So I hope you said only nice things about me. <laughs> yeah, only nice things, because there are no, no bad things to say about you. So uh, that's about those, those uh, container-ready and container-native things. Uh, the, the presentation is is on on the air yeah yeah okay just let me uh give me a second to share my screen okay i think that agar needs to uh disconnect or oh, maybe i can disconnect him hold on okay yeah uh and then i'll show him. okay And just let me know if you see the presentation or the presenter mode, because uh, I have a couple of screens connected, so I'm not sure. Everything perfect. Nice okay. Yes, on, 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 the, on the right. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as uh, I was introduced, my name is Maria Schulhatch. I uh, work uh, in IBM in Poland as a client technical specialist in storage. Uh, and today, uh, following the topic that Egor started uh, a couple of a, a session ago, uh, we would talk a little bit more about containers uh, and specifically OpenShift containers uh, from the storage perspective and discuss some of the challenges that we can endure uh, during the adaptation of containers in our environment. So uh, I'm very grateful that I started after Agor because I don't have a lot of introduction into containers, just one slide um, and there's this slide. So um, as Agor already uh, told you, it is containers are a standard unit of software that has all of the uh, code and all of the dependencies for the application packaged up in one little block. Uh, that's why we can run it very quickly and uh, reliably transfer it from one computing environment into another. Uh, but what I wanted to start with and run with is actually the fact that containers are actually a form of operating system virtualization. And what is the first thing that probably comes to mind when we talk about system virtualization is virtual machines and VMware. And a lot of people uh, may in the beginning confuse uh, virtual machines and containers as two types of virtualization and don't really see a lot of difference between those. So I wanted to focus my uh, beginning in uh, kind of highlighting those differences. So I wanted to start with a uh, kind of describing the three, I think, uh, parts of uh, adaptation of virtualization that we uh, we have seen in the environment in our data centers. Uh, as we uh, have seen in the growth in the adaptation of cloud native development, and especially in the development of cloud native applications, um, they have really brought those virtual machines and containers, microservices, all of those things into prominence. So if we look into this background, we can see those three major moments. When we just started uh, adopting uh, servers in our data centers to build our environments, we had uh, servers that could host a single application. And uh, we would have to size those servers in accordance to the peak workloads of this application. And even if uh, we would not hit those peak workloads of the application, uh, a lot of the time, so let's say like once a month or maybe once a year even, we would not, not be able to run multiple instances of various applications because we were not sure if our host will be able to serve this production application and its peak workloads. So a lot of the resources will just lie around and sitting around not being used. And that's where uh, virtualization started. That's where we have seen VMware come into the game and it become, became very popularized uh, in the data center. So instead of having those resources that we previously were not using, we have started to be able to choose uh, and take those resources and virtualize the applications above that into virtual machines. And because most applications wouldn't have those peak workloads at the same time statistically, so they will not be. Uh, 
you, we will be starting to use those resources better, especially with the help of a hypervisor. And the biggest player in this game was VMware, as we all know, uh, and the virtualization from VMware. So we were not having as much overhead as we, as we used to having without the virtual machines. However, you still had this very complex environment that we were managing. And even though we were making more of the resources, uh, we were st still taking a lot of storage and we needed a guest operation system and licenses for those operating systems for every virtual machine. And that's where containers came into the game, the newest part of the virtualization saga, let's say. Um, containers and virtual machines mainly uh, diff uh, are different uh, from each other in the build. And I try to show it here in those building blocks. So let's say with traditional virtual machines technology, the package uh, can be passed around the virtual machine and it includes an entire operating system on top of which we have a hypervisor. Um, and then on top of this hypervisor, we can see a couple of guest operating systems. So let's say a physical server running three virtual machines. We'll have this hypervisor and three separate operating system on tops of it. And each one will have their own libraries and then an application on top of it. By contrast, a server that would be running three containerized applications runs on a single operating system and each container shares this operating system kernel um, with all of the other containers that we run on this system. So the shared parts of this operating system are for read only, uh, while the container has its own mount point for writing. So the mount point is as an access to the container itself. That means the containers are much more lightweight in itself and they use far fewer resources than virtual machines would do. So we can even better utilize all this overhead that we still used, used to have with virtual machines. So if we talk about the benefits of uh, containers, I decided to list a couple of them here in bullet points. And the first one I already talked about is a reduced overhead because virtual machines would requ require gigabytes of capacity while containers only require capacity in megabytes. And so they present a much lighter load for us. And that also uh, kind of ties together with the rapid spin up that is listed later. Because those are very lightweight, the containers, they only take seconds to spin up so to start this container, while the virtual machine will take a couple of minutes depending on the resources that you put in this virtual machines. And one thing that actually Agar also uh, mentioned in his presentation is the isolation. So because we have those building blocks and it ties to microservices as well, we are isolating every service from the whole uh, application. So if let's say we have an attack or a virus or some kind of malware, we don't have to kill the whole virtual machine or isolate it, so the whole application, we can just take out one building block, so one container, one service, from this application and that will make it easier for us to not just take our production application off and have the downtime that we need to pay for. And definitely more very important part is the portability, which is probably was the biggest driver for the container development in itself, is the fact that we can take the container across all different operating system, all different environments, and not worry about how it will work, uh, depending on the environment. Because we have, uh, we don't require this hardware emulation that would require a lot of CPU activity. Uh, all of this is eliminated with containers. And it is the bottom line that it, they are just more support, supported in more vir environments that virtual machine would be. And last, but definitely not least, is a cost, which is probably important for all of us. And uh, it actually ties together with the lightweightness of it as well, because virtual machine requires this full operating system for each virtual machine, and then extra management for every operating system. While containers have lower software licensing costs, you don't need to pay for all of those guest operating system licenses as well. And it is a lot easier to manage, especially with such software as Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, and I will mention a couple of ways that you can even further simplify the management of your container environment. 
Okay. And here are some use cases for the containers. Uh, and they are the same as Agro actually mentioned. So most important in DevOps, in microservices. A lot of the times it's used also in batch computing and lightweight um, paths. So bottom line is containers are very efficient. Um, and I would also not go as far as to say that containers are better than virtual machines. They are just used for different things. And what I uh, like to call it is that framework is optimized for servers, while containers are optimized for storage. And we will see it in the next slide as well. So I believe that VMware and containers uh, have all their different use cases, and we shouldn't decide that one is better than the other. And they can and should coexist in a lot of complex environments. So because we are all, all probably familiar with the VMware strength, such as elimination of this routine administrative tasks, over-provisioning, the portability of a virtual machine, this higher safety than just using one, um, one single server, one single host. And we can also implement this container strength, which I already mentioned, the lightweightness, the portability, the microservices. And one thing that's pre also pretty important, this role-based access control that is uh, native in containers. So the what it boils down to is simplicity and containers are a lot of the time used for applications and simplifying those applications. However, there are also challenges that come with uh, containers that have to be addressed. Um, and those uh, come with storage a lot of the times. So I wanted to show you a couple of uh, challenges that come when you decide to um, use those containerized applications in your environment. So why is the storage so important? It is important because by default, from definition, containers are ephemeral. Ephemeral means that they are stateless. They do not uh, have persistent storage connected to them. And in, let's say, when we inevitably, inevitably need to shut down a container, let's say for hardware failure, a crash, a software update, anything, um, the stateless environment containers, they will not have any data connected to them that will be saved. All of the data will be lost. And one uh, container, a lot of the time, uh, has, has a structure over a single application, over a single microservice. So you will lose all of that if your containers are ephemeral and you did not take care of uh, tying the persistent storage to them. So that's the first challenge. And the second, uh, the second one is what we have is while adopting the stateful uh, containers, which are the containers that actually have this persistent storage connected to them, um, we also need to ch ch uh, check what kind of storage do we need. Do we need a fully a containerized storage or if, do we just want to take the best what we have in our, in our existing data center and use it for our container environment? That is also very important. And one plus uh, that we have with this uh, enabling this state for the containers is that after uh, we bring our container back to life, we can attach uh, this container um, to a different host as well. So it's very flexible. And the way that this state, stateful container works is a lot of the time uh, we would uh, have this information already saved on one of our volumes in our storage. So that's while the container dies, the it life cycle ends, and we're still able to access this information and create a new container with the same information from our physical volume that we have on our storage. And very important thing is storage for containers is not very uh, <laughs> if homogeneous. It's There are different ways you can implement it. And there are two ways of adopting containers in your storage. So the first one is a container native storage. It is also um, called often storage in containers. Um, and as it comes with a name, it is a storage that is already deployed within a container and is presented to a container as application as a ready to go storage that does not require a lot of uh, things from the administrator to in initialize it and make it available to the storage. So it's kind of a ready to go package. And uh, it is, since it is uh, deployed inside a container, it has the benefits of a container and it has um, 
it is mostly used in this hyper-converged infrastructure um, that uh, actually Bartosz will be talking about uh, after me. So it is uh, used for a little bit higher performance uh, and higher requirement uh, required for the containers that require a little bit higher performance as well. So especially with hi high computing and a lot of a lot of complicated containers that you need to take care of. The plus of the, the solution is that we take off the responsibility from the administrator and give it to our developers because uh, the developers will be the ones who will provision the storage for their applications. However, um, yeah, it, I just here I wanted to mention uh, that we can do almost the same thing. So we can do with a traditional storage, so we can store up to three copies of our data. It can be based on object file or block storage, and we can also create snapshots, clones, and replicate uh, such a storage. Mm, however, there are some plus, it's some ups and downs of such a solution, just like with every solution. Um, it is only as environment as reliable as your container environment and what i mean by that is if you don't have a good management of your container environment let's say in openshift or kubernetes um, your environment in a container native solution will also not be very reliable because the whole thing is containers so you uh, also need to invest in skills uh, of your developers especially who don't have usually don't have um, a lot of experience with provision and storage specifically for their applications. So that is another thing to consider. And if we talk about the offerings, uh, the most things, uh, the most uh, popular offerings probably will include a Red Hat OpenShift container storage, which is based on the Ceph server and our newest addition in IBM, which is IBM Spectrum Fusion, which will be presented by Bartosz later on. Uh, so I will not be talking a lot about that. Um, and the second approach to the storage for containers is a container-ready solution. And the container-ready solution is what is often called storage for containers. So it is essentially a setup where storage is exposed to a container or a group of, of containers as an external mount point over the network, so over your regular fabrics. and. It can be all different devices. So it can be a storage area network devices uh, with block storage. It could be storage defined, uh, software defined storage devices. And it also can be a network defined uh, attached storage devices. So you can utilize basically everything that you already own in your data center. And um, these devices support capabilities such as all of you already have in your data center probably, uh, which is backups, snapshots, clones, data replication, high availability clusters, all of the benefits that you have in your regular storage. And the good part of that is that when you choose this option, you um, kind of utilize all of your investment and leverage all of the, your existing investments in the data center while also introducing this new thing such as containers, not probably not as new as it used to be, but still not adopted in a lot of data centers without changing your whole infrastructure and investing a lot of money into new capabilities, new skills, new people for managing that and new processes. So what our offerings include for this is the whole Spectrum Virtualized family. So it includes Flash System family as well. Uh, Spectrum Scale, which is our NAS uh, solution uh, for uh, files, and also our IBM Object Storage, which is an object solution, a software-defined storage solution. So you can uh, you have a lot of flexibility with this, and I wouldn't say that one approach approach is better than the other. Again, both have their use cases. Container-native storage is probably more useful if you have uh, requirements for a lot of analytics, a lot of uh, portability for your applications, you want to, it to be highly, highly flexible. And container-ready storage is uh, more for things such as introducing containers in your development environment and speeding up your software delivery cycles. Um, so that way you can just decide which one you want. And it's, what's it's important is you don't really have to choose. And if in the future you want to utilize both, uh, a container-native and container-ready storage, they can work in a cluster as well. So that way, in this slide, I just wanted to show you in this 
red box uh, that is uh, an OpenShift cluster. And we can see that here we have both a container native application, uh, container native solution uh, on the left side and on the right side, there is a container ready solution. So as you can see from an architectural uh, perspective, on the container native side, the devices consume storage either as disks uh, or as an external storage that would create a new storage pool that will be used to create new volumes for the, to be used for the container application. By contrast, on the container ready side, um, we have our storage, in this case, IBM Flash System, uh, that is connected via the Kubernetes, uh, uh, via the container storage interface. Um, to the worker node of Kubernetes or to uh, the OpenShift, and it's connected uh, directly via Fabric. So there is essentially no change in how we use our storage that we already own in our data center. Uh, we just get this benefit of using um, of using containers in our storage that we already have, and all that we need for that is container storage interface. And it is especially true of utilizing this investment that you already made. If uh, you talk about the Spectrum Virtualize and IBM Flash System, because we have a functionality that allows you to virtualize more than 500 different storage systems uh, within the con container-ready cap capability. So you kind of unite this already united platform into one. And if you have a, a, hum a heterogeneous uh, environment in your data center, you can also utilize all of that and combine that in the one plat platform and just manage it from one single point to further simplify the management. And here I wanted to uh, kind of take you by the hand and provide you uh, with step-by-step -step information on how we provision uh, this container storage. So the first thing that you would do is submit a persistent volume claim, and then OpenShift will uh, bind this persistent volume claim to a persistent volume. Um, and then it will request the storage uh, to create a volume. And after this request has been created, persistent volume will, will be created on the storage system and will be registered with OpenShift and presented to your application. So it is quite simple. As we can see, there's missing point that we didn't have before is this container storage interface. And now uh, now that it is developed, it is very nice to utilize this capability in your existing storage. So um, as I wrote here, developers love it and admins love it. Developers love it, obviously, because it simplifies their work. Um, it is easier and faster to provision storage. It is uh, They are fully responsible for what they need and for what they request. And for admins, it just eradicates this routine works of um, giving the storage to the application when the administ when the developers ask for it. So it just makes life easier for everyone. <laughs> and now, probably, uh, uh, probably uh, one of the important things to mention is what Flash system uh, brings to the game. Uh, well, the first thing is, as I mentioned, the cost of this uh, container-ready approach is a little bit lower. And one thing that uh, is pretty important when we talk about the Flash system is that we support DRAID 1. So we can start with as few as three drives on, let's say, our entry system model and scale up as we go in our environment. And we can uh, scale, up, scale up with increments of even one drive as we need more storage. And if we talk about our NVMe-based models, we can also utilize our Flash Core modules, which the smallest one is 4.8 terabytes without compression. Uh, so you can actually be very flexible with your growth and plan it ahead of time as well. So the performance, as I mentioned, um, on our NVMe models, especially uh, where you can utilize the Flash Core modules, which are drives that are produced by IBM, um, NVMe drives, they have an always on compression that does not affect the performance of the system. So that also gives you the possibility of increasing your performance and uh, also utilizing the data reduction in the hardware compression um, while also using your containers and 
making most out of your environment. It is also important to manage that we have the Spectrum Virtualized software itself has a, a possibility to integrate with public cloud. And uh, the fact that we can uh, virtualize over 500 different storage system from different vendors, we can also give this capability of public cloud to those systems. And the data availability, uh, again, the high availability cluster that comes from 5035, it is possible to cluster our systems with the adoption of containers and give, uh, get up to 100% of availability. So our data will not be only protected on the uh, on the container side, but also will be protective on the volume side on our storage systems and backups as well. So we can also use our product plus that has a function of a CSI snapshot. And here I just wanted to show to you uh, the IBM Flash system portfolio very quickly. Probably a lot of you have seen it already at some point. Uh, just to mention that we have all of the portfolio supports the CSI driver. So the whole portfolio can be integrated with uh, OpenShift and containers. And starting with Flash System 5200, it is still an entry model. I would call it entry, especially by price, but definitely not by functionality. Um, we can utilize all of those benefits that I listed beforehand and some more uh, for, our, uh, for our usage of uh, containers. And that's, as I said, that we also have um, one thing to mention, uh, it's pretty important as well, that with uh, our flash systems, you also get an AI-driven software, soft storage insights, that can also give you recommendations uh, on your infrastructure and how to better utilize your resources available and improve uh, the configuration of your flash system as well. And as I mentioned, a storage software for a public cloud. If you don't want any IBM hardware in your data center, you can still virtualize your uh, existing systems with a storage virtualization function that can be uh, just purchased as a software itself, just to simplify the management of your existing storages. Yeah, and just as a summary, of the flexibility scaling performance that we get with a flash system uh, and containers. Just uh, a couple of things. As I mentioned, you can use a couple of different drive classes, such as the fastest drives in the market available that are SCMs, the flash core modules that come with their own benefits that I unfortunately cannot talk a lot about today because we don't have time. But if you are interested, please uh, contact me, I'll gladly take up about an hour of your time <laughs> talking about that. So, and we also have uh, NVMe SSDs available that are generally available in the market. Uh, we also can start with three drives. And as I said, we can non-disruptively grow in increments as small as one or more if you need uh, with your environment. So very scalable. We can also scale up with additional SAS based expansion enclosures with either traditional S SSD drives or NLSAS drives and HDD drives. And we can scale out up to four-way clustering starting from FS5200 and two-way clustering for FS5035. Yeah, and as I mentioned, the not always on compression was zero impact of, on performance. Very great, great quality of the flash core modules. Also, the fact that we can uh, cluster those systems also allows us to create this high availability cluster, which we called HyperSwap, and we can achieve up to six nines of availability on our systems. Yeah. And uh, one thing to mention in the last couple of minutes that I have is uh, it is important that we, as Agro mentioned, probably will all be moving to some kind of hybrid cloud infrastructure sometime in the future. And a lot, if we have this heterogeneous um, environment, which probably all of us have, because we don't, we want to avoid vendor locking. What comes with it in the future is that a lot of the vendors have different, um, different APIs, different instructions, different tools of how to connect to this cloud and how to connect their storage system to the cloud. Uh, 
And one way to to also uniform this uh, and simplify the management of the platform is use this uh, Spectrum Virtualize. If you want it on-prem, you can use it on-prem. If you want it in the public cloud, you can also connect to a public cloud such as AWS, which is probably, as we mentioned, cloud native applications are what driven uh, the containers. So probably that's what you will need the containers for. Um, so you can use the public cloud services for this as well. And that way you can utilize all of your investments on in one platform, simplify the management and utilize it across 500 arrays. So pretty important uh, to note that. And I think that this probably summarizes the benefits of the flash systems. All of the benefits that you would see in a regular data center also apply because as I mentioned, with the uh, usage of the container, ready storage, the usage of your storage system does not change as much as it would use, as it would change with a container native app, uh, storage. So that's probably uh, it for my presentation. Uh, I'm also looking forward to listening what Bartek have prepared, has prepared about the uh, container native uh, solution that we also have in the portfolio right now. So stay in tune for that. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Uh, we 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 uh, are a bit uh, 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 not ahead of time, but a bit late. But I I think we still have time for one question. Rimvidas is asking when we will have CSI uh, support for hyperswap. A CSI support for hyperswap, you can do it right now on different systems. Uh, if you want to implement it on uh, this cluster as itself, it has to be approved. But uh, just it, it it depends on an environment. The general, I'm not sure when the general appro approval for the whole system will be available or if it's on the roadmap, but we can check the whole environment and see if for your specific environment that's possible. So Rimvidas should contact you uh, directly and, and you may, may... Yeah, because I need a, lot, a little bit more information. Of course. <laughs> <for this. laughs> Thank you, Maria. Um, and uh, I would like to, to introduce you our last speaker from uh, IBM. Uh, that's uh, that's Bartosz... Uh, Why well, I've written my... Okay, that's, that's Bartosz Pizan. Bartosz Pizan. Uh, yeah, and uh, Bartosz... Uh, deals with, with many things as, as the pr uh, previous presenters yeah, uh, are dealing also. So Bartosz is a specialist uh, um, uh, which, which uh, is delving into software defined storage, uh, into object, uh, object data storage and uh, also hyperconverged solutions. So uh, I've named three or four terms I'm afraid of. Uh, so Bartosz, uh, could you explain about, uh, about uh, wow. those solutions? Uh, thank you, know. thank you very much, Aldous, for the introduction. Uh, let me just maybe uh, share, share the presentation. Uh, you know, actually I was trying to uh, open up my camera, but I'm currently in a hotel and I'm a little bit afraid about the performance of the network. So please mm -hmm. maybe not let me uh, open the camera. Yeah, uh, you, you looked great uh, in, in that picture, so. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Mario, I think that you should uh, as well stop uh, sharing the screen. Maybe. OK, can you see my screen? Yeah. OK, that's great. Uh, so hello everybody. Uh, my name is Bartek Pizan, and I'm working at IBM for already uh, for something about four years. God, uh, it's a pretty long time. So uh, I'm uh, from uh, from the uh, from the beginning. Uh, I was dealing a little bit more with the virtual machines, with the uh, let's say that a little bit more monolithic applications. Thanks God that Agor and Mari had already uh, described it to you, and I don't have to. Uh, I don't even prepare this uh, this explanation, so uh, so I would rely on their uh, basic. I mean, I, I rely on their knowledge. Uh, so maybe just let me share you a little bit more information about the uh, Spectrum Fusion. It's the kind of new product, but I would not say it's a very new product. Like I don't know, IBM has uh, has has developed something uh, from the scratch. Uh, it's a little bit different because it seems that we have a couple of the uh, a couple of the puzzles 
and we uh, when and, and we and we uh, take it to the uh, one big picture, and we have created this hyper converged uh, infrastructure uh, solution for the actually for the enterprises. So maybe at the beginning, let me um, say a little bit more. What is this great uh, HCI? So hyper converged uh, infrastructure. Uh, this is a Wikipedia definition. So just to understand what uh, what is what is it made for? Right, it's a software defined IT infrastructure that virtualizes all of our elements in our data center. Of course, the ones which we want uh, of conventional hardware defined systems. Uh, of course, we have this hardware defined. We have this software defined this storage. Um, so many different things uh, which are a little bit separated from each other. I mean, of course, we can. We can virtualize them. We can put it those in a cluster, in a VMware cluster, in a uh, Spectrum virtualized cluster, just like Mary uh, mentioned uh, mentioned a couple of minutes ago. Uh, but there is a little one thing more: that why don't we have something special, especially for these uh, modern workloads with um, thousands, hundreds or thousands of the containers with uh, mixed uh, virtual machines uh, from different vendors. And why don't we just virtualize all of our infrastructure, all of our hardware, uh, which are as well the, the, the software defined storage. So, so the storage, the, uh, the servers, uh, and uh, even the networking. Uh, why don't we put it in a one place and get a kind of appliance from this? So this is the way why this hyper uh, converged uh, infrastructure uh, has been uh, has been made in IBM, and thanks to the it's it's not a secret that IBM has uh, has merged with uh, with the Red Hat, and uh, thanks to this we have a lot of uh, Red Hat um, software solutions, which are extremely helpful for uh for defying uh for, for making such a such an appliance so what do we need here in a typical uh in a typical um approach to the hci we have three lawyers the lawyer one is the storage platform so we need a very good very secure and reliable storage platform so very good hardware when we can uh, have this uh, when we can store our data maybe put some replication or something like this on the second layer is the storage services. So here we have all these IBM Spectrum portfolio products. We have backup, for example, this uh, Spectrum Protect Plus for uh, for backup of containers, for backup of the virtual machines. So we not we are not making a backup, uh, let's say that of the physical machines, but it's more like the software defined uh, software uh, software defined uh, way of uh, of uh, backup and. That's from the storage admin, and then we are getting straight to the uh, layer three, to the DevOps. So to the people who were previously used to be uh, some some uh, somebody who was uh, taking care of the virtual machines, but right now the things has changed a bit, and the DevOps is the person who is responsible not only for the virtual machines but for the uh, for the containers for making all of this work. So. Uh, this this actually this border between the DevOps and the storage admin and the developers by itself uh, has been a little bit uh, blurred currently. Uh, if if I'm asking when I'm asking the customers, they're telling me like, okay, a lot of developers are already the DevOps and the storage administrators started to be DevOps. So it seems that uh, the best way uh, for <laughs> for earn money is start is currently to be the DevOps. And the third lawyer. Is this application runtime management? Uh, so the first one is the storage platform. It's a blue because it's a big blue like IBM. And the third one is application runtime management. Uh, so of course the red color is in this case that unfortunately it's not Ferrari, but it's the Red Hat, right? So we have this uh, mixed. We have this appliance for uh, for those uh, for those three lawyers, and to be specific, what kind of uh, what kind of products are already here uh, to provide you the best way of this of this uh, HCI uh, infrastructure? So uh, the first one uh, is the flash system, and 
the spectrum scale by itself. So the spectrum scale is a great hat for uh, to, to cover all of our resources, all of our uh, storage resources for our as well um, as well. Um, this, uh, this this server uh, sometimes also resources uh, which are uh, having the gateway for different protocols for the S3 protocol and many, many others. And here we also have this uh, infrastructure. Okay, so that's the physical infrastructure, right? But what if we have already implemented some public cloud provider? Okay, that's still, uh, that's still uh, we, we can see uh, a way to, to develop this, this HCI. Uh, we can be connected to the public cloud, to the uh, IBM public cloud, to AWS, Azure, uh, Google Cloud. As you can see, all of four uh, great cloud providers are uh, are supported here. Uh, edge computing, private cloud as well, and all of the systems. So the portfolio of the virtualizing is seriously a huge one. And uh, the second layer, just like mentioned previously, is this is Spectrum, IBM Spectrum software. Uh, Spectrum Virtualize, so virtualizing all of the system, uh, Spectrum's Pro Spectrum Protect Plus, Spectrum Archive. Actually, if we do have even tape libraries, we can cover the tape library under the Spectrum scale and understand it as well as a one appliance with the HCI infrastructure. And on the top, the third layer uh, with uh, with all of the uh, all of the possible uh, ap applications. Uh, which could be connected to the to the Red Hat, so which could be uh, talking with the uh, Docker with containers. Uh, is this uh, Cassandra, Kafka, MongoDB, whatever, and IBM Cloud Packs as well. So we do have this uh, Red Hat OpenShift uh, for that's the environment for the for the containers. Um, okay, so what is the fun uh, the, the foundation uh, of of our uh, of our storage platform? So how all of this, all of those uh, different protocols, block, file, uh, object, in most cases, how they're working inside of the uh, of uh, Spectrum Fusion. So first of all, uh, we do have uh, we do have, of course, native block access, uh, and after that, with the Spectrum scale, we can have uh, POSIX, NFS, SMB, HDFS for Hadoop, uh, S3. And as well, the CSI, which uh, Mary already already mentioned, so we can connect uh, we can connect our on-prem infrastructure to the cloud with the active file management. It could be made for uh, high availability, for disaster recovery as well, and uh, those uh, and those um, systems uh, could be separated by by many many kilometers. So could be divided by many kilometers. Uh, simultaneous multi-protocol access, of course, that's uh, that's I would say that it's native, especially when you're talking about this uh, NFS SMB uh, or S3 as well. Uh, high performance storage storage caching. Uh, it depends what kind of um, it depends what kind of infrastructure do you have. If you have a very high performing uh, application, and of course you need high performing uh, storage, then NVMe NVMe would be the best way to uh, to use this HCI in a fusion. Um, archive to tape or to cloud, just like mentioned previously, so it's it's possible we can even connect a tape library uh, for the last tier for the coldest data, for the data which are not in use, um, I don't know, in day-to-day -day task for the developers, for example, but sometimes, of course, we do have to create the archives, we do have to create the backup places. So in this case, tape or cloud uh, would be the best way. Uh, by the way, the tape is uh, is fifty percent. Uh, okay, it seems six times uh, is six times cheaper than the slowest NLSAS HDD drives uh, repositories. If you are talking about a uh, petabyte, uh, petabyte petabyte backup uh, backup uh, targets, uh, optimized for AI use cases, of course. And here, uh, in this case, we are talking about uh, specific applications uh, which are in need of using this. Uh, for example, NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA um, hosts processors because NVIDIA, after the uh, taking the Mellanox uh, and and ARM as well, almost uh, has made uh, its its own servers for AI processing with the uh, GPU. So we understand that HCI is a perfect use case if you have 
uh, already or are you are going to to buy uh, some uh, some nvidia servers or power 10 uh, because as far as i know they're going to have some uh, gpu acceleration um, and the last one data security so immutability and encryption of course all of our data needs to be secured so warm uh, on a on a uh, system on a file system but warm as well uh, physical warm on a tape on the tapes is already provided uh, that's a that's a very good use case uh, if for example you are kind of university so you need to uh, have uh, some mm, you, you need to follow some uh, government regulations uh, then the tape drives are a very good use case as well uh, okay, so this spectrum fusion is just a simple write, right? So it's it's nothing extremely sophisticated. With I don't know, uh, it it does look uh, like previous uh, like the previous mainframe. So it seems to be that you can put uh, inside uh, whatever you want. Actually, of course, uh, it has uh, some basic builds. So it has some hosts for it has some servers, Intel servers for uh, for uh, deploying the spectrum scale for deploying the open shift as well. Uh, so it is a very highly scalable system. Uh, of course, if you'd like to have, uh, it's only made not only for the containers, but as well for the, uh, for the virtual machines. So that's, uh, we have to also, also remember about, uh, global data platform, uh, which could be stretched to the public cloud, uh, to on-prem cloud, uh, I mean, to the private cloud which is on-prem or to the private cloud as well in a, in a uh, cloud provider so somewhere else. Uh, IBM Cloud Satellite is a perfect way of um, integrating our system. So from, uh, from the user view and from the developer view, um, our on-prem could be connected to the, uh, to the uh, cloud. Uh, I mean, our prem location could be connected to the cloud and we will uh not have any disruption i mean it, it's completely tra transparent for the user uh, that's a very uh, important thing uh, because of the ibm cloud satellite uh, ready for our application of course with this nvidia a100 gpu uh, for uh, ai processing as well uh it's it's all working it's actually made even for that for very high uh, performance computing uh, fully redundant hardware architecture with no single point of failure. That's actually a standard currently. Uh, every single uh, every single hardware has redundant, I don't know, fans, uh, CPUs, uh, nodes, and all these things. Which uh, single uh, failure, single failure of a single component will not cause any damage in our uh, in our access to the data. Uh, start small with six servers. The, the smallest one is with six, ser six servers and scales up even to 20. Uh, so yeah, it's very scalable. It's very flexible solution. Of course, uh, you will not store there. I mean, of, you can, but uh, it, it's it's pointless to do that. You will not store there um, some archive data only or some uh, data which, I don't know, has 10 terabytes. You, you need 10 terabytes, you will not uh, probably need uh, this uh, HCI spectrum fusion. So it's made for a little bit bigger uh, bigger needs and a little bit uh, bigger um, bigger requirements of the client. Just like mentioned, it's very good for the, uh, for the all, uh, all universities, all the uh, companies which are handling with the AI, for example. And my friends has already described all the details about the Red Hat OpenShift. And that's the picture why the Red Hat OpenShift is on a top. I mean, uh, we are talking about it, not because it's our product, but because the Red Hat is the best way to implement, of course, in an en en enterprise range, uh, to implement uh, our, our containers and to have this support, very high support from, uh, from the company, from the Red Hat. So that's the reason why the Red Hat is understood as a leader even higher than uh, the company actually, which developed the Kubernetes, so, so the Google by itself. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's the reason why you're talking also about, about the Red Hat. That's the reason why uh, IBM acquired the Red Hat. And 
we finally see that our two companies are working great in this case and spectrum fusion i think that's the best uh the best example uh for this uh for this simultaneous work of, of both companies uh, especially when we have very reliable and secure storage very high performing storage uh, very high performing uh, power service as well and very well uh, software which is this red hat openshift so that's the very simple slide why why the spectrum fusion why the hci by itself first of all it's fast it's for the very high performing uh, applications i mean for for the application which requires a very fast access uh, it's a very simple to deploy because it's appliance all of the uh, required uh, hardware and software is already there uh, the third thing is a scalable scalable flexible you can build from six servers and scale up in a single uh, in a single uh, cluster even to 20 uh, you can of course create a couple of the clusters you may connect it to the cloud and all these things it's a very secure you have encryption there uh, encryption uh, in, in flight data in flight uh, encryption uh, so uh, everything is redundant so it's a very secure uh, appliance and the last thing we have to understand it's for the specific use cases so if you have 10 terabytes of the uh, data which are let's say that mixed then i think that hci uh, is not the best way to, to implement uh, currently in your uh, in your case so that's all from me my my presentation uh, seems to be a kind of intro only for the uh, for the hci and for the spectrum fusion by itself so i hope that uh, you have enjoyed yeah, thank you thank you bartosz uh, just just a small question uh, which which came to my head uh, uh, of course, large enterprises have various uh, storage uh, uh, sources or storage providers. But to, to, to your opinion, uh, is it uh, is it bad thing to have uh, many uh, storage providers, or, or there's, there's, there should be some efforts to optimize their, their number? Uh, uh huh. Uh, that's that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I think that every customer has its own. Uh, its own approach. But a uh, couple of weeks ago, I had been in a biggest Polish insurance company and they told us like, okay, we need a, it's too, too many systems for us. We need a one great virtualization. We need to have one uh, one thing when where, where all of our data, where all of our storage system from different vendors, HPE, Dell, and all these things uh, could be managed. Uh, I mean, we need one management, uh, one management view. Uh, one management dashboard for that so i think that from the management point of view it's a good to have something which will virtualize our system and will be manageable from from one dashboard but from the other hand when i'm as well talking with my friends uh, my colleagues from the lab services so the people who are uh, implementing the, uh, the 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 systems and they are like Jesus Christ, I hate when clients, and clients hate, hate it as well, when they do they have uh, different vendors, because every single time some, somebody is implementing something, uh, is uh, so something is not working well. I mean, it's not working well, not only from the infrastructure who is being implemented, but which is already there. So I don't think that having one vendor, two vendors uh, in, in your data center is a really bad thing. Nowadays, yeah, perhaps, actually. Perhaps there are legacy systems uh, which which are using some some sort of storage, and you cannot do with it. Anyhow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.